Hello, this is Bill Myers, and today we are going to be talking with the filmmakers uh, on a on a really wonderful documentary entitled Who We Are. We had been on a path toward racial justice that was amazing. There was the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. We were at a tipping point. We're 50 years later now. Once again, America is having to look at issues of race dead in the eye. And once again, we are at a tipping point. And the question for all of us in this room is, what are we going to do about it? Well, I'm walking and talking with my mind. If I make the statement to you, America was founded on white supremacy. I'm walking and talking with my mind. You could say, Jeff, that's an extreme statement. And what I would say to you is, don't believe a word I say about it. All you have to do is go look. Slavery had nothing to do with the war because they were treated as family. I don't know if he can be reached, but if no one tries, he definitely won't change. Land chance took place in this very spot. Everybody needs to know what happened because it's a part of our history, American history. America has demonstrated its greatness time and time again, and America is one of the most racist countries on the face of the earth. Those two things are not mutually exclusive. Well, singing a shout with a Virginia passed a law, an enslaved person's death while resisting a master is not a felony. Would you look at those words, please, and think about the videos you have seen in the past 10 years? Shut fired! It's still not a felony. Sing hallelujah. We want all Confederate memorabilia removed from our city. We have to save other lives. It's just too big of a story. Hallelujah. And this is who we are in America. Today we have with us the filmmakers and the star of the show. So please help me welcome today, Mr. Jeffrey Robinson. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for being here. So I would like to start with the simple question, where did this idea come from? Uh, what was it that inspired you to want to pursue this? Uh, I think, uh, the presentation, which is the kind of uh, one of the main things in the film is something that I started working on probably back in 2011. Uh, and some circumstances in my family required my nephew who lived in New York uh, to leave New York and come to Seattle to live with my wife and I, and we hadn't had kids before. So it was a huge, huge uh, event for us. And having this young black man in my home uh, made all of the things that I worked on as a criminal defense lawyer, all the issues of racism, all of a sudden they weren't just like issues. It was like what was in my house. And uh, I was looking for help on how I raised this young man. And as I looked, I started reading. And as I started reading, I started finding out things that I had never heard before. And that was why I started doing this research and putting together the presentation that led me to uh, my meeting with Sarah and Emily. Okay, okay. So, uh, Sarah and Emily, welcome. Thank you. I, I do want to share with our audience before I go any further, your father was a hero of mine. Uh, I had a uh, very strong um, interest in the legal system. And there were a few people who exhibited tremendous courage and were truly rock stars and walked the road less traveled. And your father certainly was one of them. In fact, I was looking at the piece that you guys did, Disturbing the Universe, just this morning. And when I was reminded about his involvement with Attica, there is a friend of mine who is here in Indianapolis, Indiana, the Reverend Marvin Chandler. Marvin Chandler was one of two black ministers that accompanied that delegation that went into Attica prison. And I called him before this interview to get his, his feeling and thoughts on, on, on that experience with regards to uh, being there with your father. And 
his statement was very simple. He said, we were, we were fighting a, a battle that, that was already lost when we stepped in there. And that's in retrospect. And, uh, but he did want me to share his greetings with you, his daughter, you know, uh, Mr. Kunstler's daughters. And so I'm delivering that now. So, so now moving toward your perspective and your involvement in this piece, how did that come to be with regards to your connection with Jeffrey and then the idea of, of fashioning this into a, into a documentary? Uh, well, I, uh, I'm Sarah Kunstler, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I'm a lawyer. Um, in addition to being a documentary filmmaker. And I heard Jeffrey speak to a gathering of lawyers that was assembled for no higher purpose other than to get continuing legal education credits so we could keep our license current. And uh, Jeff was the featured speaker. Um, and, you know, the, the topic was implicit bias and racism in the criminal justice system. And I went to it um, and thinking that I knew a bit about implicit bias and racism in the criminal justice system. Um, I, um, I have an anti-racist uh, commitment and I, I grew up the children of, of, of uh, a mother and a father with an anti-racist commitment. And I uh, left Jeffrey's talk completely changed. He, he was sharing information I had never heard before. He, he drew a through line from, you know, 1619 to the present day that was incontrovertible and had implications for my life that I had never considered before walking into that room. And um, I was just blown away. And I, I walked out of, of Jeffrey's talk and I called my sister, um, who is my, uh, uh, my partner in crime and in filmmaking. And... Uh, and we started talking about how we could how we could try to convince this person to you know this with this phenomenal talk to let us uh, get involved in making it into a film. Wow! It may it may seem on the face of it that we only make feature films about male attorneys, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not the case. Our our interest in justice in the criminal justice system um, has has been throughout our career. Most of the Sarah and I have a have a production company called Off Center Media, and most of what we've done over the past um, twenty some years um, have been advocacy videos, clemency videos um, for, for people on death row, and highlighting particular cases of injustice or just just fighting for the humanity of of imprisoned people trying to save their lives. Mm. So, so when your sister brings the idea to you. What was your your reaction initially or response? Uh... Um, you know, starting a film, a documentary is a huge undertaking, and and um, I mean a feature length film, uh, and you know we hadn't we hadn't made one since the film we made about our father. You know, we toyed with the idea on on some level and in different projects, but nothing had really stuck. Um, so at first, I, you know, I had some hesitation, you know, I'm like, who is this guy? I don't know. Can he carry a whole film, you know, um, <laughs> what's this going to be, you know? Uh, but as soon as, as soon as I first heard Jeff speak, I, 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 I felt the same thing Sarah did and I, and I knew we had to do it. And, and then the, the, the issue was, you know, is persuading Jeff, is Jeff going to want to, going to want to in order to work with us and, and, you know, allow us to come along with him on this journey. So, um, we, uh, we, um, Sarah got in touch with Jeff through some mutual um, friends and attorneys, um, and we met Jeff uh, for for coffee. Although Jeff will, will remind us he does not drink coffee; he get hot chocolate. Um, <laughs> uh, and we, at least we told him, you know, our idea, or at least at that point, it was just, you know, it was just we want to film this presentation and get it out to the largest possible audience. You know, how can we do that? You know, how can we work together to do that? Mm -hmm. So, so Jeffrey, uh, so you get this call and these folks are interested in taking this to another level and you meet for hot chocolate. And uh, so, so, so what, what were your thoughts at that point? Did you, did you have a vision of this being something bigger or, uh, or was this kind of a surprise that there was that interest of, of, of blowing up this message and really pushing it out? 
I was a bit surprised. Uh, I had been doing, you know, presentations like this since about 2012 or 13. So mm -hmm. this was just what I was doing. And I was a criminal defense lawyer and I did it when I was a criminal defense lawyer. And then I went to the ACLU and I continued to do it. And I had no vision of uh, making this into a documentary film, but, you know, meeting Sarah and Emily changed that. And as we got to know each other and got to trust each other and saw that we were really trying to do the same things, uh, then the concept uh, <clears throat> became real. And I think we met at the uh, Starbucks in Manhattan on June 20th, 2017, and 364 days later on Juneteenth, June 19, 2018, we were in Town Hall Theater with a packed house and seven cameras. and. When we finished filming, I thought, oh, that's it. We just made a documentary. And I, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so very wrong. <laughs> wow. So so your your journey, I, I find it very interesting in how you were able to, and I, and I think it's critical that you were able to um, take a, a, a look and an examination at your own personal upbringing and and the reasons that you feel the way you do I, I thought that was that was incredible to be and it's necessary to be able to um, establish a foundation um, and and uh, um, and uh, an ex a series of experiences that certainly inform us as to you know um, uh, why why you've chosen the path you have, the many things that you've been able to experience and see. Did you? So, so tell me about that. I mean, because those are those are tough looks when we when we take a look at ourselves and and get honest about that. Uh, I'm biracial, so there there, and I don't say that as a proclamation, but I will say that there are some very painful experiences within my um, ex personal experience. Um, that, um, you know, I, I had, you have to look at these things. I mean, they, they are the reason I have these conversations, uh, you know, so it's not by accident or, or, or anything. It, it's very much on purpose. So, so how about you and, and taking that look at your hometown and your life growing up? Well, I, when I first started talking to Sarah and Emily, I think I was pretty adamant that I did not want the film to be about me and it's not about me sure. um but uh they were very persistent and they are very persuasive and as we went around the country i would give uh this presentation it's a three-hour presentation on the history of anti-black racism in america and we would <clears throat> go into people's homes they'd see the presentation or hear about it and talk to us and then they trusted us to uh, record and tell some really powerful and painful stories. And Sarah and Emily kept saying that it was necessary, um, you know, for in terms of this being a film, uh, you know, it's like, who the hell are you? And nobody knows who you are. Why should, why should anybody listen to what you say? And so, you know, we were talking about things like uh, school desegregation, and that's something that had an impact on my life. And we talked about the Fair Housing Act and redlining, and that's something else that had an impact on my life. So uh, there were other people that were opening up their kind of uh, personal stuff. And I think that made it easier for me. I felt like I finally felt like uh, if I was asking them to do that, then I couldn't refuse to do it myself. Mm hmm. So, so what did you learn when you took a closer look at that, at your own? My older brother and I integrated a Catholic school in Memphis, Tennessee in 1963. I was six years old. And in August of that year, before I turned seven, I met this kid named Robert Oriens. His nickname was Opie because he looked exactly like Ronnie Howard on the Andy of Mayberry show. And uh, Dick, his older brother, 10 years older, became our coach when we started playing, you know, basketball, football, baseball in the second and third and fourth grade. And there was an incident at a basketball game in Mississippi that I didn't know about. And Dick told me about it. And so uh, that was uh, 
that was a huge thing uh, for me because, you know, he had been holding on to this incident for 50 years and had never said a word to me about it. Um, so uh, the experience of uh, talking to people uh, in my life about events that I wasn't completely knowledgeable about uh, was very powerful. And now I, I, I'm very, very grateful that I, I now have a fuller context of, of what was going on uh, and the people around me. It's, it's really a gift. Mm. So, Sarah and Emily, um, observing this, you had mentioned, uh, um, Sarah, that you were impacted and, and somewhat moved and changed by... Uh, his original presentation. So now taking this even a step further, now stepping into a little bit more of his world. I mean, what, what are the, what are the, the, the things that you were able to observe the both of you, uh, Emily and Sarah, I mean, uh, as you, as you saw these, uh, these things beginning to unfold as you were creating the documentary, such as the experience that Jeff just shared, how does that resonate inside of you? inside of you? Um, J Jeff is the, the heart and soul of this film. Um, he really is. And it's, it's Jeff's ability to show his vulnerability that is a way in for audiences. These are tough issues we're dealing with. These are things people are not comfortable feeling, thinking about, um, sitting with. So when you see Jeff whether it's him on stage or, or him interacting with people from, from his past. Um, he lets you see him for who he is. He lets you see his vulnerability. He lets you see his self-doubt. He lets you see his humanity um, and his love. And I feel like those are, with, without that, there's, there's, there's no way in. You know, there's no real way to get people to, um, to sit with this material um, that's really very, very hard to reach otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we were so, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm so grateful that Jeff came around on incorporating his story um, because I really, I feel like that's the, that's the heart of the film. The heart of the film is that, you know, those, the, the, the I mean, there's other, there's other emotional highs and lows in the mm -hmm. film, but um, the, the ones that, uh, that are personal to Jeff, um, I feel like really ring true to, to an audience um, and, and, and make the issues that we're dealing with, the questions that we're asking, um, possible for people to sit with. Okay. Sarah? I will, sure. I will say, I mean, this is a film primarily about facts, right? I mean, what moved us originally was that Jeff had assembled a, a, a narrative of uncontrovertible facts, right? From, 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 uh, the, from the early, from the founding of this country to the present day, where he looks at historical texts. He looks at what um, the decision makers in this country were saying in their own words about the decisions they were making and how those decisions were perpetuations of white supremacy and anti-black, perpetuated white supremacy and anti-black racism in this country. But in turning that presentation into a film, uh, what was important to us was taking those facts and combining them with the real human cost of those decisions. And, you know, that's part of what bringing, you know, Jeff's story into it does. It's also part of what bringing the, the stories of the other participants in the film uh, does. You know, this is a, a history and a legacy that has a cost for, uh, that, that still costs us, that still costs black Americans and white Americans in this country deeply. It's, a, it's, it's really an open wound. You know, America's original sin of slavery is an open wound that we've just covered over but haven't healed. And so kind of bringing in those stories, um, you know, the, the story of Dick and Opie and, and the, the, the pain that, that, that they still carry, um, the story of of, of uh, countless of family members who have had um, 
of, of, of Dr. Tiffany Crutcher, whose brother was taken from her, um, you know, uh, Gwen Carr, whose son was taken from her, murdered by police, um, you know, the story of Larry Payne, who's, uh, you know, and, and through, through his sister, Carolyn Payne, who, who was uh, murdered just, a, a, you know, days, a, a week before Dr. King was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee. I mean, these are, you know, these stories, and, and, and not just stories of people who have lost family members either. We have um, stories of, of, of people standing up and taking action, taking action in their own lives um, to fight against white supremacy and anti-black racism. But that too, standing up in that way also has its cost. Um, so, you know, we, we, we speak to, um, you know, people like Tammy Sawyer, Commissioner Tammy Sawyer in Memphis, who was pivotal in getting uh, Confederate statues taken down in her town. We speak to uh, you know, uh, Senator Hank Sanders and, uh, uh, you know, Judge Bea Ora Rose Torre in, in Selma, Alabama, who were, you know, pivotal um, in the civil rights movement there. And so all of these pieces adds texture to a story um, and, and turns it into a film. You know, it, 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 it builds a living, breathing film around Jeff's talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I uh, did have the chance to to see the film and uh, and I got quite a bit out of it. I I really did enjoy it. I I enjoyed the way you were able to fuse again the, the your you know your personal story as well as the actual case that you made. Uh, and I think that that's very very powerful because as you know I've been doing a, a podcast on social justice and racism I got about 60 of them in the can and so I've heard and learned tons and and I, and I, I mean to say that learned I, I continue to learn more and more about this thing with every conversation and so um, I, I, I learned you know a tremendous amount from from your presentation and and how and and how you laid that out the actual presentation itself um and how you made the case and and i well, I, I can actually say that i have never <clears throat> given the exact same presentation twice that may be a slight overstatement but i don't think so and it's because as you say i continue to learn and so i'll give a presentation on a monday and this has happened before and i have mm-hmm. another one on thursday and on Tuesday and Wednesday, events happen in America, and I have to say, I got to change this because this thing that just happened is a better example of the point I'm trying to make than the thing that I had. And it's not that I throw away the thing that I had, but I'm adding to it. So, you know, the next presentation I give will be radically different than the last presentation I give, and certainly radically different than the one that was in the film because we did that Juneteenth, 2018, George Floyd was alive. Um, You know, January 6th hadn't happened. So uh, we hadn't heard anything about anti-critical race theory legislation. So, you know, these are all things that continue to happen. Mm -hmm. So, so that's very interesting. So the things that have unfolded since the making of the film, and so let's talk about that for a minute. Let's just bring that, you know, to to the present. I mean, the things that are pressing on us right now that did not exist at the time that you made it. Can you make some observations with regards to more recent developments and, and, and what you see there? Well, in 2018, I was talking about uh, a move in the Texas state legislature to teach that uh, slavery was a secondary issue in the Civil War. We see that that has now morphed into an out and out attempt to try and rewrite history and to erase some of it from the curriculum of our children in the classroom. Uh, We have, and so when I said in 2018 that America was at a tipping point, that was true and it's still true. Because for a country that's 400 years old, tipping points don't last for a moment or a year or a couple of years. They're a decade long, at least. And we are in the middle of one right now. And what happened on January 6th and the anti-CRT legislation, I think are examples 
of desperation. And so when people say, you know, is there any progress being made in changing this narrative, in getting Americans to understand things that they haven't before, there's a critical part of this, and I'll leave that for another discussion, but understand, uh, within 18 days after the descendants and survivors of the Tulsa massacre made America look at what happened there, within 18 days of that, Congress made Juneteenth a holiday, a national holiday. That has never happened before, never even been considered before, and they did it in 18 days. That's why folks want these, that's why some folks want these anti-CRT laws to be fast, passed because they are terrified of what will happen if we actually reckon with the truth about our history. It will mean that we will change things. That's why you see desperation on January 6th. That's why you see people yelling and screaming at school board meetings about their fourth graders being taught something that isn't even taught until you get to law school. And so when I, you know, I'm, I, I try not to be a, a false optimist and I am definitely still concerned because a tipping point can go either way. But mm -hmm. when I look at the people who don't want us to reckon with the truth and how they're behaving, what they're saying is, we're really concerned that this is about to go in a radically different direction. So you mentioned the, the, the great fear. What is the fear of that truth? It's the fear of, of, of your, your creation story falling apart. <clears throat> you know, understand what we're asking people to do. The American creation story is incredible. It is powerful. And it was given to all of us, you know, in our mother's milk. And so you're asking people to change their creation story. That's a huge deal. But the thing that people are afraid of, you know, the, at one level, and I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so I can tell you things that I see. One thing I think is that there are some white people in America who are afraid that if things change, we, Black America, will want to do to them what they did to us because that is in part the American psyche of get even. That's what the whole criminal justice system is about. You know, we're going to punish you for what you did. And so your children are always afraid to acknowledge wrongdoing because they don't wanna get punished for it. This isn't about telling the truth about our history, it isn't about punishing anybody. It's about reckoning with why America looks like it does today. And if the truth tells us that the reasons America looks like it does today are based in anti-Black racism, something that we can solve and eliminate, then we should be concentrating on those things. So I think the fear is just, it's, it's natural human fear of having to reckon with something that you've ignored for a long, long time. And I think all of us have had experiences where we have avoided something forever. And when you finally reckon with it, it feels like, man, I wish I had done that a long time ago. Right, right. Emily, Sarah, weigh in. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just want to speak to that as a, as a white person and, and certainly not as a white person who's a representative of my race in, in any kind of larger way. But, but I will say that, that, uh, um, I don't think that white people have anything to fear in reckoning with this history. I think that kind of, un this is, you know, this is a, a, a country that we inherited, right? We're all the inheritors of this system in the way it is. We're not the architects of it. So we don't have the culpability of being the architects. It's not about personal shame or responsibility or feeling bad or, or culpable in that way. It's about, it's about gaining knowledge and using that knowledge to take responsibility for what our collective future looks like. And I think that's a, a profound task, but I think it's a, I, I think it's a wonderful mm -hmm. task, right? To, to get to, uh, you know, to get to figure out how to get through this together is about it's about moving towards a place of, of collective liberation. So I, you know I, I I think this is a history 
that, that's a, that, and, and all of us here, Jeff, Emily, and I, we're all optimists. We feel that, you know, that learning this history is going to set us all free. Um, it, it's not a chore. It's, it, it's a wonderful thing. So I just, you know, um, you know, we like to say that this film isn't about calling people out. It's about calling people in. Mm. And this is a, this is a, a, a process that we all need to be a part of and called into. I mean, if you think about it for one second, yes, sir. what would America look like <clears throat> if the poverty rate in black America right now is 19%, one out of every five people in our community living in poverty? What would it look like if that was cut in half in the next 10 years? What would communities all over America look like because of that? White, black, Asian, every community in America, we would all be better for it. The economy would be better for it. The community would be healthier. We would all be better for it. So this isn't about taking away anything from anybody and giving it to anybody else. It's, I, I think Sarah put it really well. It's about our collective future and how do we get to a place that all of us really do want to be if we think about it. Emily? And we can't get there without learning this history. There is no there, you know? I mean, that's that's where we are now. Where we are now in this divided America is a place where we've refused to learn our true history. So we really, you know, we see this this film as a movement, you know, and and gaining this knowledge as, as, as essentially a, a revolutionary act. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this this film to be used as a tool uh, to, to to bring people to that point where they can start addressing these issues, um, where they can start having conversations that they wouldn't have otherwise, um, where they can begin to look at the problems that we're facing and find real solutions because they finally understand why those problems exist. Okay. Okay. So, so the idea of if if I'm and I might be overstating here the. So upon being able to share this film, we think that or hope that this would be a, a discussion starter uh, or perhaps is that is that the idea? I think I think uh, every single attempt <clears throat> that we have made mm -hmm. in the criminal legal system, in our economic system, in our social system, every attempt that we have made to reckon with anti-Black racism in this country has been done with an ignorance of this history. And so if you wonder why we continue to take two steps forward and three steps backward, it's because we're not addressing the root causes of the problem. And you can go back to 1919 to a report written after an uprising in Chicago, Illinois, when a young Black man was killed on Lake Michigan. And you see what they're saying about what has to change in policing in America? That report could have been written yesterday. And so what I, what, it, it's more than a, a conversation starter for me. It okay. is the foundation of any change that is actually going to last. And we have lacked that foundation for way too long. And that's why we take a bit of progress forward, and then it collapses under the weight of, of the circumstances. So this to me is, is the ingredient that has never been there. And so it is a conversation starter. It is a way to bring people to have in, uh, very hard conversations, but it is a necessary part of anything we're gonna do going forward. And, and this, film, this film is just a primer, you know? This is this is not this this is not doesn't even represent all of Jeff's presentation and the history that he's researched, mm -hmm. um, and when he you know and, and even that's just a small a small fraction of what people need to learn. But hopefully this film can give people you know a, a, an understanding that this history is there, that it's lying in plain sight, that it's ready to be to be found and gathered and absorbed. Um, and Jeff, uh, Jeff, you should talk a little bit about the Who We Are project and its mission of education because another one of you know, the, something that's important to all of us and a goal of this film is to inspire young people to go out and reclaim history for themselves through finding primary source materials, but also through collecting the narratives 
first person narratives because those are so important to, um, as well. Uh, it's such an important part of this history. You wouldn't get the whole story if you just got, if you just had the facts. Right. You need you need the people's experience too. Yeah, that, so to that is really the, true. I'm sorry, I'm um, and. No, no, that's fine. But Jeff, why don't you t t talk a little bit about the Who We Are project? In the March of last year, I left the ACLU where I was a deputy legal director in charge of their criminal justice and racial justice work. And I left to form the Who We Are project. Uh, I left because I knew there were incredible leaders in the civil rights community who could easily take my job at the ACLU and push it forward. And I left because I left for the same reason I came. I left my criminal defense practice because I wanted to focus more particularly on global issues in the criminal legal system and dealing with racial justice. And I left the ACLU because I wanted to focus more particularly on this one lane of education. And so the Who We Are Project is uh, an organization, a 501c3 organization that we've formed. This film is simply the first thing that the project is doing. And we are going to, uh, we are going to address three different audiences, which will encompass all Americans, essentially. One is youth, and we're going to address them in schools, in states that haven't lost their minds and are actually trying to teach real history. And we will address them outside the schools in states that have anti-CRT laws. If they really think that banning books and telling teenagers you can't read this is a way to get the teenagers not to find something out, I think they're in for a very, very significant surprise. We're also going to address community groups, everybody from the Rotary to religious groups, about this history and what they can do to start a change. And the last area we're going to is corporate and government offices, because there are corporations all over America who have participated, knowingly or not knowingly, in practices and circumstances that they have the power to change that will radically impact the Black community in a positive way. And I think, part, I think a lot of them are looking for ways to do that. So... The Who We Are project is going to focus on education because, as I said before, it's the thing that we haven't had. And if we can bring young people into our project, in our speakers bureau, we're going to train them how to speak to audiences. We're going to talk to them about the value of original source documents and then send them back into their own communities to talk to their parents and grandparents and great grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbors about things that they probably had no idea that their relatives had experienced. And if we collect that information, historically accurate, supported by documentation, and then provide it in a way that young people and Americans all over the country can access it, this is what prevents history from being erased. This is what prevents people from saying, oh, it was only two or 300 folks that were killed in the Tulsa massacre, when the activists and the descendants say 4,000 people were unaccounted for. And when they find mass graves, and then just last year said, well, we found them, but now we're gonna cover them up because we don't really wanna know what's in there. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing that prevents that from happening. And we've seen it happen in our past. The Who We Are Project is just going to be one voice in this area. It's going to take more than one organization, but we are going to be one organization that will uh, make sure that Americans have access to our true history. Okay. So you mentioned uh, uh, being able to reach out uh, in, in, in your educational uh, um, uh, uh, agenda here. You had mentioned uh, different um, uh, service organizations. You mentioned Rotary by chance, but um, ironically, I want to also say, please include Optimist International. You are all optimists, and I am also with Optimist <laughs> International. Um, proud to be Thank the you. first Absolutely. generation black person to serve in one club in the history of the organization. All I did was show up, but my grandfather laid the foundation <laughs> for that, and then my father followed through. Uh, but yes, there is a there is a a significant 
issue there uh, with regards to um, really uh, not at all really embracing any parts of this type of thing. And I say that it is optimism that pulls us through this thing, but I just find it very interesting that optimism, as defined in some instances, is the safety of not rocking any boat, just you know, uh, just keep everything kind of the way it is and just smile and wish everybody well. And I'm like, you know, that that that's kind of whipped cream being placed over, you know, uh, the dog's business. You know what I mean? So I believe that we have to address these things. So there's one other thing I, I, I want to pose to to all of you, and it is economics. As I hear all of this, I, I, I just keep being reminded that uh, Dr. King had made a statement about, you know, you know, uh, um, being able to sit at the lunch counter, being able to sit on the bus, all these kind of things. You know, all that's fine. But then all of a sudden, in the latter part of his life, I think he zeroed in on the actual target. And that was when he went to Memphis and he was getting ready to p participate in the poor people's campaign. I think that when he zeroed in on the economics, that's when a target was placed on him. I'm well, just many saying. people say many people will say that uh, the speech he gave in Chicago, Illinois, on April 4th, 1967, was the thing that put a true target on his back because he mm -hmm. wasn't just talking about lunch counters anymore. He was talking about economics he was talking about the vietnam war right he was talking about poor white people and so all of a sudden uh he became even more dangerous than he had been and i think you know that's just one thing i would say is that you know we deify dr king today and i really wish that people who were saying oh the activists today should be more like dr king i wish they would go back and look at what america was saying about dr king when he was right. alive because it's the exact same thing that they're saying about activists right now. And, and, and so, uh, you know, this, 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 this sense of optimism, uh, there is a quote from uh, a guy that I had as a professor in, in law school, Roberto Unger, one of the most brilliant people that I ever, ever uh, in, engaged with. And he and Cornell West wrote this thing saying, hope is not the, con I'm paraphrasing, because they use bigger words and it sounds much prettier. Uh, hope doesn't cause action. Like you were saying, it's like, oh, let's all come together and hug and feel good. That doesn't cause action. Mm -hmm. It's action that causes hope. It's the other way around. So I'm constantly telling myself, you know, if you want to be an optimist, if you want to have hope that things are going to change, the first place you have to look is in the mirror and ask mm -hmm. yourself, what are you doing uh, to push that forward? And it's amazing. I had no idea that this film was going to become, you know, the first time I saw a rough cut of what Sarah and Emily put together, I was in tears. I was, I was devastated. I'm like, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. I, I have no idea, you know, how they made this. Uh, but they didn't make it out of hope. <laughs> they made it <clears throat> because... We got down to business and tried to figure out how are we going to do this thing and let's start traveling and interviewing people and this maybe will work and maybe it won't. Let's just do it. How do we know? Let's go talk to this guy in front of a Confederate monument. We don't know what's going to happen, but let's see what happens. And that is how we got to where we are. And I'm never going to forget that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that. That's quite powerful. Again, I, you know, I, as I was, as I. As I'm listening to this and, and knowing where we where we need to go, uh, I mean, forward, uh, but I, I just continue to question what are the forces? What are the forces besides comfort, comfort, convenience? Uh, you know, I don't want to deal. Let's keep everything the way it is. The white hero, the, the whole the whole thing. I mean, the, you know, I, I just keep wondering. Well, I, that's the reason I mentioned economics, because I really do believe that there's a there's an interest at play that was at play at the beginning of our nation when it was only white landowners that were able to vote. I mean, so when they said all, they just meant all us, right? I mean, they really didn't mean right. all everybody. But let, let's be clear. That did not include you and me. And so, um, so I think that 
again, that, that notion of economics, um, you know, you are, you are, uh, uh, I don't know if you're still in Memphis, but earlier, uh, this year, well, actually last year, uh, I was involved with a climate, uh, climate reality and a gentleman named Justin Pearson, who, um, organized a, 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 a community of folks, black folks to stand up against these big oil companies in the Bahalia pipeline. And this was two uh, major oil companies partnering from uh, from Texas, you know, billions of dollars and all this. And they, they decided that they were going to run this pipeline through a black community because they said it was the path, the path of least resistance. And these folks yeah, I bet it was. began to to sort of organize and galvanize. And I was you know, at the time that I was made aware of this story, there were probably 200 people involved in this effort, you know, that were mostly from uh, climate reality and some, some other organizations and agencies. And within like two weeks, all of a sudden, Danny Glover, Jane Fonda, all of a sudden, Justin Timberlake, everybody converged on this thing. And this thing turned into a massive movement. Anyway, the upshot of that was these court cases kept getting kicked down the road continuance while these guys were working in the back trying to grease, you know, uh, and and still pave their own way uh, in spite of. And uh, the the heat got so strong that they just said, we quit. We're backing up. We're not even going to take it any further. And that was uh, Justin refers to it as people power. And I, and I thought that was very uncanny, but he's right out, right doing that righteous work in Memphis, Tennessee. But that just absolutely happened. And the city county council finally voted to put these restrictions in place so that these types of things would never, well, at least happen in that way. Right. I mean, everybody's right. always trying right. to find some some way around a work around or a, a crack to, uh, to to maneuver in. So. There, there are amazing things, uh, but these challenges just seem to be, you know, no matter what decade, what time frame, it's just like, it's just, okay, here we go again, here we go again. What about the voting rights? That was not necessarily up for grabs in 2018 when you did this. What do you think the effects of these and this legislation that's going on state to state right now? Well, it's... Uh you know, to quote Yogi Berra, it's like deja vu all over again. Um, We've seen this happen before. It's why the Voting Rights Act was passed in the 60s. And uh, states are passing these laws and the Supreme Court is pretty clear saying, you know, we're taking our hands off because racism is kind of over. That's that's what Justice Thomas tells us anyway. So uh, I think what you will see is once again, people power coming up in the 2022 uh, midterm elections, and that's gonna be critical. And so, you know, they can close polling places, but unlike in the 60s, it's gonna be very difficult for them to stop cars of people being driven to a polling place. And what I think you're gonna see is community activism all over the country in areas where it really matters. Uh, because the attempt to suppress the vote is significant. The tools they have are powerful, uh, but they're not omniscient. They're not omnipotent. It's not Mm -hmm. like it can't be overcome. So we are going to be in a battle uh, in the midterm elections, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. Emily, Sarah, what do you think? Where are we with this thing? Yeah, uh, Heather McGee just wrote a fantastic book about about the economics of racism called The Sum of Us. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it yet. Not yet. But, you know, part of what she talks about is how um, we've been fooled in this country into believing that uh, that uh, we're living in a zero sum game. Right. That 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 lifting that 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 fixing racism, that that increasing equality, that lifting up black America means pushing down white America. Um, and and it's just, it's, it's not the case. You know, uh, more e- economic equality is, economic equality helps everybody, right? The, the, the fight for 15 in the fast food industry is not about giving, uh, giving, 
black employees or employees of color $15. It's about giving all McDonald's employees $15 an hour. You know, the, the, the fight for Starbucks to unionize, um, you know, uh, fairness in, in mortgage lending. You know, all, all of the, the efforts uh, are, are lift up everybody. And, and I think that, it's, that that's part of the, the mythology we've been fed or that, or that maybe just, you know, part of it is it, you know, instinctual, like, you know, that this is going to be a taking from me. If someone else is getting, then, then, then there has to be a taking. Um, and I, I think that, that we need to just look, figure out how we can look around at all Americans and fight for all of us because we're all people of dignity and that's what we want our country to be, right? Is, is a place that supports every single one of us with humanity and dignity and that, that everyone gets the, the treated in the way that we want to be treated. <laughs> and, and, and it sounds easy when you say mm -hmm. it, um, but there, yet there are still so many obstacles toward getting to that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 this this fear that maybe you know inherent in in all humans is only fanned politically um, and and racialized. Um, so you're put in a situation where um, poor white Americans are voting against their own best interest in order to keep poor black Americans from advancing. Mm. I mean, racism has always been used that yeah. racism has always been used to 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 get white america to vote and act against its own interest and and you know at the base of that we think is a lack of understanding of our common history mm -hmm. so um so Jeffrey, what when when you uh, met Sarah and Emily and uh, you uh, find out that, that they are the daughters of William Kunstler. I don't know. Did you ever have a, a chance to, to meet or work with Mr. Kunstler? I was, uh, I never had the opportunity, uh, but I knew all too well who he was and what he stood for and what he accomplished. And, uh, it was, you know, as I've told people before, when Emily and Sarah got in touch with me, I knew their last name. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was part of the reason I said, let's have coffee, but I didn't know them. And it was getting to know them that was much more important than uh, uh, having known their father. And I feel like I have met him in some casual way just through the stories I've heard Sarah and Emily and their family talk about in terms of things he did and things he said and the kind of person that he was. Um, and I think, uh, I think if he were to see what his daughters are doing, he would probably feel like they're getting ready to surpass him. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, I, I I must say I was um, in in our communications with the uh, with the the PR folks and whatnot. They uh, at at some point it it was it, it became Jeff, Emily, and uh, Sarah, and I wasn't really sure when when we would be able to schedule this. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, yesterday, thank goodness that we were able to to bring this one in. And when that happened, I said, OK, now I need to because I watched the piece. So I saw, you know, all hour and a half of Jeffrey. I mean, I saw you walking through the paces, but I didn't see, you know, the, the your 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 uh, your your uh, your your posse there. So I decided I said, OK, it's. So yesterday evening, I look up and I'm so, OK, Emily and Sarah. And so I start you know digging in. I'm like, OK, I need to get myself together so that I'm prepared to to do this interview. And I found myself it, beyond just Emily, Sarah, Emily, Sarah. All of a sudden I saw this last name and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute now. So as I you know went on I, Wikipedia or wherever um, and then discovered that these were the daughters of this giant of, I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to flatter. I'm just saying, you know, there are not many people who step, you know, into 
messes like that and, and, and circumstances like that. And boy, he was, he was just remarkable. And I say, you know, traveling, you know, the road less traveled and, and that is, uh, that's significant. So then, then I started to get kind of terrified because I thought, oh my gosh, there's two of them. <laughs> I don't know if I can hold my own in this conversation. So, but, but nonetheless, what I did was I went and looked at your previous work, the piece that you did on your father. And so there were many things that were shared in that um, when he made the statement that, you know, we are all, you know, all white people are racist or, what, or something to that effect. And I was just curious in, in as you have journeyed through this experience with Jeffrey, how much of the information and the types of things that your father either imparted to you, um, whether it was something said or it was a, a certain behavior or so, how how does that factor in? Because it I, I know it's got to be there because he, he he was such he embraced those kinds of conversations and dialogues and cases that were nobody else really wanted to touch. And I'm saying, well, you guys are do you are doing work that is appears to be uh, at the very least influenced in some way. Uh, by the work of your father and, and, and your mom, you know, respectfully. So can you speak to that a little bit? I think that growing up with the parents that we had, um, we knew that whatever we did, it would be in the service of, of racial justice. Um, there's a lot of overlap. I mean, I know Sarah, Sarah did become an attorney, um, but there's a lot of overlap between the practice of law and documentary filmmaking. You know, there's a lot of similar skill sets and there's a lot of similar goals. Um, it's narrative, it's storytelling, it's it's controlling a message, um, it's reaching a wider public. Um, one thing that we learned from our father was how, um, and he, if he ever talked about any uh, of any victory he had in a courtroom, he always credited it to the larger society. You know, it was never about what happened in that room or those twelve jurors. It was always about a, a time and a place and, a, and, and being part of a larger movement um, that, that, that allowed for that change to be possible. Um, so in, in that way, I, I definitely see the work that we do in a, in a similar vein to the, to the work um, that he did, you know, and, and we, we think about him all the time and we talk about him all the time. We're always telling Jeff stories, you know, when they, when they come up, um, whether it be stories about him personally or politically, um, you know, he, there was, he had a lot, he was a storyteller. So there's, there's always, there's always something relevant to share. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, we were definitely influenced um, by both of our parents. Um, and it, it almost feels like we've been on a path to make this film, you know, from birth, <laughs> you know, when you look at it now, it's like, you know, um, so, and, and all these pieces just fell into place in order to, to, to let that happen. Mm -hmm. yep. Sarah. Well, you know, Emily, Emily spoke about our dad as a storyteller and he was definitely someone who kind of who understood rhetorical power when you're when you're kind of trying to trying to sell an idea um you know i think that's one of the things that uh appealed to us in jeff and jeff you know is another person who we saw a speaker who can really kind of who can who can sell you an idea he's a trial lawyer he can he can he can conjure from nothing um with rhetorical power and i think one of the images that sticks with emily and i from our father's rhetoric is an image that that's very um, uh, that comes up quite frequently in the film that you recently saw, Disturbing the mm -hmm. Universe. Um, the image of Michelangelo's David, the statue, and uh, our our dad used to talk about that statue a lot because it is, or or he would say it was, and I don't know if this is accurate from an art history perspective, but he would claim that it was the only statue of David before he throws the rock at the giant Goliath. And so in that moment, he has the rock in one hand and the sling over his shoulder, and he's at a moment of indecision. And he needs to decide whether or not he's gonna throw that rock or whether he's gonna quiet, quietly slink off into obscurity. 
And for our father, that moment had a lot of rhetorical power because he believed that's a moment that all of us encounter in our own lives, that we will be faced with moments large and small where we have to decide whether to commit to our beliefs and our convictions and stand up and take action or do nothing. And when our father spoke about that, about that statue of David, he did it to urge audiences to throw the rock. And I think that, that, that this film in a certain way, this collective action we are all taking is a collective rock throwing, right? It is a decision to not slink away, to stand by the power of our convictions and, and, to, and to take that chance. And we hope that in sharing this film with the world that we inspire other people to take that chance as well. That is awesome. And uh, I certainly wish the very best with this, with this film project and your foundation and, and the work of, 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 you know, on boots on the ground. I mean, as far as dealing with the different agencies, organizations, uh, education, I think it's it's so very very important. So I want to thank you for this powerful work that you are doing, and the powerful piece that you put together. And so it is uh, a pleasure and an honor to have you here. And I am so excited that this is the very first installment for Black History Month, and this is the conversation that we're having in 2022. So I want to thank you so very much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Jeffrey, for being inspired to uh, to, to step out and, and, and throw that rock, really. I, I so, so appreciate you. And I wish you all the best. <laughs>